Welcome to Legends with Bevo. Thanks to the Holdy, Coopers, Anytime Fitness Glenelg, and Paradise Mazda. And now, here's your host, Bevo. The great Hamish McLaughlin, great to have you on Legends with Bevo for a chat, mate. How are you going um, over there in Melbourne? Obviously, we're thinking of you guys. It must be a bit of a surreal feeling at the moment. Yeah, it is, Bevo. Thanks for having me on. It's a, uh, it's a time, hopefully, that we won't go through again. Um, I'm not quite sure how we've mucked it up so badly compared to the rest of the states, but it's sort of not state of origin. We're all in it together, and we hope that we can climb through it and get out on the other side reasonably quickly. We're locked down for six weeks. I'm not sure whether that's going to be the reality or not. I sort of my gut feel is that we could be locked down for a long time, sadly. Yeah, it's um, I really feel for you guys. Hopefully, you can you know get get back to normal a little bit sooner and, and maybe less than those six weeks. So, um, fingers crossed. What have you been doing to sort of keep yourself busy during this whole COVID situation besides pulling the footy? Well, I've been lucky. I, I've got a wife who is fantastic and three young kids, and we live on a few acres outside of town. So we've got horses around and lots of um, cleaning up to do, fires to light. So we've had a good time as a family. I said to Soph when it all started, let's all choose something we want to be better at at the end of it. So the kids chose that. The riding, they wanted to be able to canter off by themselves. They're four, six and eight and they've achieved that. So my wife wanted to get really fit again. So she's been working on that. So we've sort of just taken it as an opportunity to be close. And you know, I said, but we, we won't get this period again where we're sort of uninterrupted and together. So we've sort of embraced what is a pretty drastic and dire time and made the best of it. And luckily on the farm, you don't get cabin fever, which I'm sure many are getting. Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful point you've made there, Hayme. Um, speaking to so many people and you know, people that have you know, families with kids, and that's one of the positives, I guess, is like you said before, spending that more time with your family and you know, it gives you a bit of a wake-up call and, and makes you think, you know, I don't need to be as busy as I am and, and you know, we can do some fun stuff together as a family. Well, I haven't been on a plane since March and it's just you, you forget what things were like and you also realise how crazy they were. I was on a plane at least once a week, return and back, sometimes twice. So four flights a week, hotels, cabs, Ubers, you know, it became a bit of a cycle. And Thursday nights and Friday night football were often interstate, which meant you were sort of away from family for 24, 36, 48 hours. And the young kids are starting to get to a point where they want to kick the football or go for a ride. And it's been so nice to leave, you know, not fly and be back in your own bed at night. But it also just gives me great perspective on what is it that you want? And I'd sort of just underlined for me, to be honest, that family's number one and everything else is white noise. And last night we saw, hey, um, Geelong-Brisbane game. This is quite unbelievable. Uh, for the first time since 1952, not one particular team for the whole round actually has home ground advantage. Um, what a surreal feeling. And it must be a bizarre calling a game at the SCG with those two sides um, not even being the Sydney Swans or, or you know, uh, home side. Geelong hosting Brisbane in Sydney. I was calling from Melbourne. Bruce McAvaney was calling from Adelaide. So, yeah, there's a lot of firsts during this lockdown period. You said it was the first time since 52 that no team um, had a home ground advantage, which is right. It's the first time ever that all home and away games would be played outside of Victoria. So, I think there's been 2,415 home and away rounds in VFL, AFL, and for the first time ever, not one in Victoria. Yeah, it's phenomenal. And uh, how'd you see the game? It's obviously, uh, Brisbane started pretty well, but the Cats sort of ran over them in the end. Uh, how'd you see the game? I'm a Cats man. I was, I was worried going in, really worried when we were 22 points down and didn't see a nine-goal burst coming. Then the goal kicked one late in that second term. And I think Hawkins got one late in the second. And then seven to zip in the third term. It was just a complete momentum shift, which often happens. But in this shortened you know, season in terms of rounds, but shortened games, 20% less. Those margins are harder to overrun. And you know, 22 points became a 27-point win. It was a pretty significant turnaround. I, I went in thinking the Lions might be the team to beat and left pretty pleased where the Cats were. And I think it's one of those seasons. There's 18 teams in it. I think you can put a line through the Crows. Fremantle will go back to the West, which means you know they're going to get a bit of home ground advantage and maybe... You know, a bit of a run on, but I reckon there's 
10 teams that you could make a very good case for that could win the flag. I mean, teams like the Western Bulldogs at the end of last year were scoring more than anyone else. And you thought, I think they'll beat the Giants in the first final and can do some damage. Now, they lost to the Giants, but and then they started the season really poorly, won the last three. You could make a case for Richmond just about to find their rhythm again. Now, last year, they were six and seven going to the bye and everyone had written them off. They didn't lose again. You know, Geelong, they beat Brisbane, who are the premiership favourites. Uh, Brisbane last week beat Port Adelaide, who hadn't lost. West Coast go back over there on their own dung heap in front of their home crowd, it seems like, from next weekend. They're going to have a big run in the West. And, you know, St Kilda, everyone thinks that St Kilda is sort of a, a little pup that bites on the ankles and does nothing else. Bulldogs were the same in 2016 until they won the whole thing. I just, I just think it's a fun season. Whoever manages this surreal world we live in best and takes on the adventure might just come out on top. You know, it's funny you say that, Hamer. I've been having arguments from pro supporters. Um, and I keep saying, because they keep saying, oh, this season doesn't count, you know, um, put an asterisk next to it and stuff like that. And I said, well, if your team was going as well as Port at the moment, I'm sure you wouldn't be saying that. So I, I personally think, um, not just because Port's going well, but I think, if anything, this season, you deserve it even more like, um, because of all the adversity that you have to go through. I think there should be two asterisks as just to highlight how brilliant the premiership win was. I, you know, Port haven't seen um, South Australia for a while. Fremantle have been in Queensland. I'm not quite sure how you could diminish the win. All I would do is you know, add, a, add a tick to how brilliant the win is. If, if your team is in the grand final and they win it, in 15 years' time, you'll be thinking how remarkable they were to get there. And the record books will say premiers forever. So... If your team's not going well, there might be an asterisk. But if your team's in the hunt, this means as much as ever. Yeah, it's very, very exciting, that's for sure. And uh, to have footy back and, you know, potentially every night of the week, maybe even Tuesdays and things like that. So, um, yeah, it's definitely great for a footy fan. <laughs> um, now, Hamer, obviously your, your brother's been under the pump. And personally, I think he's done a wonderful job considering, you know, I've never seen this situation before. But um, have you had much of a chance to catch up with him lately? And how, how's he going? Well, I haven't seen him too much since March because everyone's sort of been locked down other than for a brief period. Uh, I think he's lost about 11 kilos, so he probably needed to lose at least that. Um, <laughs> he's looking leaner than he ever has just through stress. So it's not the right way to lose the weight, but he's lost a few kilos. The thing that, you know, I've said this to a few people, when you've got an issue in your own business or in your own life, not many people know about it, but the AFL is loved by so many, and so are the 18 clubs. I think one in 26 Australians are a member of an AFL club. You, you realise how much the game and the clubs mean, and that comes a big responsibility to save it. I mean, there's a very real um, possibility that the game becomes financially crippled. Now, that's less likely now, given all the work they've done and given the season is underway, and it looks like a season of some description will play out. But... When you're the man in charge of making sure those things don't happen, you have a lot of sleepless nights. And I think for a long period, he's doing sort of 19, 20, 21 hour days. That just wears you down. Yeah, I think he's um, handled it really, really well. And, and the hub situation, it's, um, it's quite bizarre. We spoke about earlier, obviously, um, the team playing all over the place. But um, what's your thoughts on it? And, you know, um, the, the idea of you know, Port and the Crows playing in Queensland and these teams playing in Sydney and then obviously Perth in a few weeks' time. Yeah, what's your thoughts on the hub situation? Who do you think benefits from it? I don't think anyone, really, because I think by the end of the season, everyone will have done time you know, in foreign venues. I think the hubs are great, personally, because without the hubs, we have no season. You now We all want the season to play out, and we're living in a time when so many crazy things are happening. It's a season where you've just got to be accepting and... If a hub is the worst case scenario, gee, we're lucky that the sport's being played at all. And without the hubs, the season wouldn't happen. Without the season happening, the broadcasters don't write out the cheque. And without the cheque being written out, the club itself and the league falls on its knees and, you know, maybe worse. So I'm, a, I'm triple ticks on the hubs. And wherever those hubs are, Queensland, Sydney, Western Australia, South Australia, Northern Territory, Tasmania, New Zealand, just make them work. Absolutely. And the grand final this year, there's talk of it. Uh, obviously, it's most likely not going to be at the MCG. Uh, there's talk of it being played now. A lot of people are saying Sydney, but 
you know, how good would it be to have it at the Adelaide Oval, though, Hayne, especially if Port's in it? Well, wherever it is, you'd love to see a crowd. I, I, I don't care where it is, as long as there is a grand final played, because that means we've got to the end of the season, the clubs and the AFL, you know, sees it through as such. Um, MCG's got a contract to 2057. My best guess is this is the year where the AFL and the MCC uh, can say, do we really need to honour that? I, my best guess is the MCC would say no. Um, make it work for yourselves. If you move the game to Optus, for example, and there's 60,000 people at Optus and they're paying XYZ a ticket, call it $500, that's $30 million, plus all the corporate stuff around it. Sponsors get um, their contracts fulfilled. There's a monumental financial case to move it if it means people and um, commitments being met. Um, if that's at the MCG and people, that's fabulous. If that's at Adelaide Oval with people, fabulous. I'd much prefer to see it moved with people than an empty MCG. Could not agree with you more. Well said. Um, now, let's talk about your own journey, Hayne, because you're an Adelaide boy born and bred, um, like your brother yep. Gil. Um, how did you sort of end up in your amazing gig at Channel 7? Talk us through the journey. Uh, I grew up on a sheep farm in South Australia. Um, my first job was shoveling sheep manure from underneath the wool shed, putting into mum's empty chaff bags from her horses, putting it on dad's truck and selling it to mum's friends in Adelaide for $10 a bag. But while I was doing that, I just wanted to play either football for Nord in the SANFL, as it was called there. It's been renamed the Sandfall. And then if I couldn't do that, I wanted to play Davis Cup tennis for uh, Australia. Neither of those things happened. And when I was going through university, I... I wanted to become you know, involved in sport in some way, shape or form. And I ended up working for Craig Kelly, who's another South Australian in a, at that stage, a small business called Elite Sports Properties, which was managing athletes. And I head up, headed up their sports and entertainment venue, uh, sorry, sports and entertainment division. So we would have you know, golf days, golf tournaments, big lunches. We ran an Olympic project for um, Sydney, which was enormous. And then in Salt Lake City and, I used to run the events and I used to hate paying an MC because I'm Scottish. So I'd just stand up and save the money and the budget and host a lot of things myself. And then one day I think a guy from Channel 7 saw me hosting something and he said, why don't you come and do a pilot with Channel 7? So I went and did that and I read from an auto and he said, you're not much good. I said, can I just tomorrow just do a panel, just having a conversation with a few people and we'll see how we go. So I organised a few people, Grant Hackett, uh, Dutchy Holland, I think it was, Andrew Thompson, Gill, maybe Nathan Buckley, and we just did a, a panel chat for 20 minutes. He said, okay, that works. And he said um, about a month later, do you want to do some TV? I said, yeah, okay. And I was working for Craig Kelly at the time. And he said, um, what about you host a footy show? I said, yeah, I'd love to. When? He said, on Sunday. And that was the start of game day in 2008. He rang on a Tuesday and we started hosting a show on a Sunday. I've never had any TV experience. And 13 years later, you know, we were still going in round one this year and then it's been put on pause because of COVID, but that's how it all started. I was literally working for a sports management group, standing up and hosting a few lunches, and someone in the crowd said, why don't we take a chance? What a wonderful story. I love that. Um, you know, because you're always, you're watching guys like yourself and Bruce and these people on TV, and obviously everyone has to start from somewhere, and it's just amazing to hear those sort of stories, Heyman. Um, your passion for sport is quite incredible, and, you know, no matter what sport you're you're hosting or commentating, you just knowledge is a bit like Bruce's, just, just know everything about every sport. How much time do you spend researching, though, on that particular sport that you're covering, like whether it be the Australian Open or horse racing? Because you're just a gun at whatever you do. <laughs> well, going back a step, no one's anywhere near Bruce. He's Winks and the rest of the field are chasing for a second. <laughs> but he was the one that said initially, and so in 2008, Bev, I was speaking about getting the opportunity to host Game Down. I said, could I just speak to Bruce before the first show? And I just had half an hour with him. And he said, there's three things I'll tell you. First of all, do the preparation. Now, he put his arms out and he said, you'll do, you'll do this much preparation. Now, you'll only need this much, but you don't know which, so do it all. The second thing, and it felt odd at the time, but now it makes sense. He said, never wear anything on air that you're uncomfortable with because you'll be distracted and you need to be fully focused. So always, if you're uncomfortable with a shirt or tie, wear one you're happy with so you're not fidgeting and worried. And that's become you know, evident a few times when someone comes out with a purple suit and you want to wear blue. So you say, blue's me, don't put me in the purple. The last thing he said, which has been great for me, is he said, don't try and be anyone else. You'll be a very bad, bad version of them. Be the best version of you you can be. So 
that was all great advice. And that comes back to your preparation piece. So the pre preparation is really important because on a Thursday night, you're not sure who you're going to be talking about. You know, Sam Simpson might come back in for the Cats. And unless you know that he didn't play at all last year, but he did win the Cats VFL Best and Fairest. He played six games in total. Hadn't played since late in 2018. His dad was a 100-gamer for the Cats between 91 and 98. You really don't know much about him. So go and flick a few pages, find that out. So if he has a big night like he did last night, there's a few things to talk about. And you just don't want to be caught out on air with the world watching without enough to say. And you end up doing a lot of preparation. And hopefully that recall you know, is there when you need it. But yeah, it's the preparation piece has been really important for me. And I don't feel like it's a task or arduous because I love sport so much that when you're researching Winks and her sequence of wins or Sam Simpson or Roger Federer or Rafa, it's all just a joy. Yeah, I, I totally share your passion having sort of been involved with sport, you know, on radio before in the past and, uh, and TV as well. Um, I wanted to ask you, obviously, you've done some, some really interesting interviews over time. Hey, um, you started a show called Last Time I Cried, which is on the AFL website. Um, I yep. love it. How did this show sort of come about? And uh, the, the, the interview I saw the other day with you and Dane Beams is just one of the best interviews I've ever seen, not just saying that for some talking to you. I just found it like, amazing. How did this sort of show come about and, and what's been your experience of it so far? Yeah, but, uh, I'm not quite sure when I thought of it as a concept, but it was something I'd always wanted to do, just allow people to talk about largely their vulnerabilities, but also wonderful moments in their life. You know, Koch was speaking about the joy of childbirth in one of them and, you know, how much he enjoyed that. And Lee Matthews spoke about, you know, final game and other bits and pieces. But I just wanted men to be able, you know, not just men, we're keen to, I've asked Daisy Pierce on a few times, but she's so busy, she hasn't got there yet. But... I just wanted it to be a blank canvas for a conversation to start that has very few boundary lines. And I went and uh, was asked by Anita Frawley to host Spud's funeral last year. And when I was standing up on the stage looking out, there were about a thousand people in the Moravan Town Hall, largely men with their partners, and all were crying. And I was driving home that night thinking, I haven't seen that for a long time. And it was so refreshing. And I said to my wife, so people cry a lot. But they often hide it. You know, I've been thinking maybe, maybe it's as simple as just to show that when was the last time you cried. And if you've seen the show, that's my opening question. And we never really know where it goes. But I think it was around that funeral time in September of Spuds where I thought maybe. So I made a couple of phone calls and... I said to Channel 7, do you want to do it? And they were really keen. And a few things changed at 7, which meant it couldn't happen. So I rang Sarah Wise at the AFL, and she's head of AFL Media, and I said, do you think this is a concept that could work? She said, I don't think you'll be able to get, be able to get people to talk. I said, let's do a pilot and see what happens. And we did that. We did it with Trent Cochin and Alex Johnson, who made some mine, and I told my story. And she said, wow, that's, that's really powerful. Let's see how it goes and you know we, we said let's see if we can get a sponsor so we did the pilot sent it off to a guy called Damien Moo who is the CEO of AIA and he's really big on making a healthier happier Australia he's a life insurer he wants everyone to be living a great life and he underwrote it and we did a nine episode series and I think he's keen to go again which is great and you know who knows where it goes but I'm really pleased that we've done it because I'll get the order wrong, but I think the first was Campbell Brown speaking about his mum passing away and he hadn't really cried too much. And then Tom Boyd on depression and giving the game away and finding a happier way to live. And Alex Johnson on all the knee reconstructions, Koch on childbirth. And uh, what else have we done? Lee Matthews talking about what got him and he wasn't sure why in the year that his mum died. Um, Gilbert McAdam, who hasn't been released as yet. Um, and Paddy Dangerfield spoke about Phil Walsh and how that affected him. So I, used, I, used like, I like people. I like having conversations. And it was just a nice way to have a different conversation. And luckily, it's gone really well and it's resonated. Yeah, the Dane Beans ones I saw the other day, um, you held it together really well. Because obviously, you know, it was, it's such an emotional thing like Dane talking about his dad. And um, you're trying to hold back tears yourself, Hayne. 
I'm a crier, so <laughs> there were tears coming down my face and Dane was crying and I cried a lot with Campbell Brown and you know, he spoke about how his mother sort of got another six or eight months out of her life because he, she was waiting, Kay, for the birth of his first child and you know, so pleased to have met Boston, Campbell's son. And he just realised everyone's got a story and everyone's hit hurdles and everyone is an emotional being and everyone's got you know, stuff to talk about and share. And it's a privilege that they decide to do it with me and I'm glad they do. And it gets me as emotional as it gets them. I'm certainly going to go back and listen to some of the other ones and I look forward to uh, the future as well going forward. Now, um, a bit of a lighthearted thing, Hayne. You uh, certainly work with some larrikins in that con box. Um, BT with his Roman Bryans and, and obviously Bruce, uh, which there's no need to give him an introduction. But um, how do you find sort of working with these guys and how do you find the Roman Bryans segments? Because that just gets out of control. It's actually hard to you know, not laugh yourself sometimes when you're there. No, that's the beauty of it, I think. I think that segment's designed to take you somewhere that you can't go as a viewer and to entertain. And he's a great entertainer. I think he got the idea is watching a Formula One race where there was someone from the broadcaster going from car to car just minutes before they drove. And he thought, why can't we do this? And it was his idea. Credit to BT on that. There's two things I'm very nervous about when I'm broadcasting Bevo. One is the live interview with the Oz kicker because it can go anywhere. And watching Roman Bryan because that can go anywhere. But you know, we're lucky to work with brilliant people. Bruce, I think, is one of the greatest all-round broadcasters the world has ever seen. Dennis Committee, I think, is the greatest football broadcaster and a brilliant Olympic broadcaster. Wonderful cricket commentator, if you ever heard his radio broadcasts. BT is his own beast. But you get to you get to work with and speak to people who are at the best um, of their craft. I mean, sitting down with Roger Federer before an Australian Open final, and once he's won, is stuff I dreamt of as a kid growing up in a country town in South Australia of 260 people. So to your point, it's great. And then you meet Larrikins. I mean, Danny Frawley was a great mate of mine. There's a story of him when he got a call early hours on a Sunday morning and there was a police station saying that he had um, better come down and check out uh, one of the players in the cells. And he'd told the Richmond Footy Club that year that they're going so well that you know, there was no exceptions, no drinking, curfews and other bits and pieces and no exception but a four-week ban. And he went down to the St Kilda police station hoping as he drove down there that it wasn't one of his good players. Don't be a good player, don't be a good player, don't be a good player because I've got to ban him, I've got to ban him, I've got to ban him. Got down to the police station, went and saw the sergeant. He said, who is it? He said, it's Brad Ottens. He said, oh, not Brad Ottens. He's in all Australian form. He's dominating the middle. He's helping us when the clearance is not Brad Ottens. <laughs> so he said, where is he? He said, oh, he's down there in cell three. So he went down there 3.30 in the morning and Brad was drunk and disorderly. That's why he'd been grabbed. And he went down to cell three. He looked around the corner. Brad looked at him. And Brad said to Sir Spud, Spud, what did they get you for? And Spud started laughing. He said, Brad, come with me. Don't tell anybody about this and we'll play you next week. And he played him next weekend. And they went on to make the prelim that year. But you know, you're, just, you're with people all the time that live big lives and have good stories. You know, Jason Dunstall, Triple M, I had a lot of fun with over the years. And Gary Lyon and Tim Watson on radio and Cameron Ling and Rich I mean, Matthew Richardson, one of the greatest men you'll ever meet. Yeah, they certainly will have worked with some great ones, that's for sure. Um, I want to ask you, obviously, you've interviewed some superstars. You mentioned Fed before. Um, hey, what's been your favourite interview and your least favourite interview and why? Favourite's tricky. Um, oh, top, top three then. <laughs> yeah, um, the interviews that I love the most is where the subject is completely engaged. Roger Federer is the master at least of pretending he's engaged. You could ask him, what do you think the weather's like? And he'll give you the greatest answer of all time. So he makes you look like a wonderful interviewer, but he's got so much depth to him. He's got so much um, life lived. It's not just a tennis player giving you robotic answers. You know, his father's Swiss, his mother's South African. He's been in spots where he wasn't performing. He found a way to perform. He's been told to retire for years and he's still in the top three in the world. He's got a Roger Federer Foundation that does great things. He's married. He's got a couple of sets of twins. He's a family man, a husband. He just gets it. You know, he's a brother. He's all those things. I love spending time with him. I spent uh, last year, Kobe Bryant came to Australia and I was asked if I would do an interview with Kobe on stage for an hour in front of uh, 3,000 people at the Crown Palladium where they're paying sort of 8,000 for the front row and 
a lot of money for the back row. And I said I would. I started researching him and I spent some time the day prior with him talking through what we would talk about. And he was so impressive on so many different levels. But I went up into his hotel room and he said, so uh, you're Hamish? I said, yes. He said, I love your Auskick interviews. Oh. I said, what? He said, well, the, you know, the stuff you do on the footy with the kids in the red tops. I said, right. How did you know about that? He said, well, when I was asked to come to Australia, I wanted to know who was interviewing me. They gave me some options and they sent a two-minute tape of the people that were options. And you've got a wife and you've got kids my age. And I thought that would work well. It's like, so yeah. you, talk about, you talk about people that are well-researched and yeah, attention to detail. And then I, he said, so where are we starting? I said, well, I thought we'd do the interview in three parts. We'd do life before basketball, basketball and life after basketball. And he said, yeah, I like it. Where are we starting? I said, well, maybe we start, you know, when you're a kid, your dad would, had finished in the NBA and he was playing in Italy and he went back to the States for the summer and you played a 60-game season as a 10-year-old and you didn't score for the whole season. Your father, at the end of the season, put his arm around you and said, Kobe, if you score or you don't score, I love you just the same. He said, how did you know about that story? Well, so I just, you know, made some phone calls and he said, I'll give you everything I've got. I said, why is that? And he said, because you've obviously done the work and I respect people who have done the work. And you know, he, he on stage was just, he had such an aura about him. Was, there's two things that I love when I'm interviewing. Someone that is interesting is, is great, but as long as... As long as they're interesting and interested, then they give you the best interview. And, you know, Roger, uh, Kobe, I've interviewed Bruce for the Sunday paper. I'm in love with Bruce. I've got a man crush on Bruce like very few other men. And so they're the guys you love being involved with. That They're interesting, but they're interested. And your least favourite? I know that's a hard one to answer, but one that where, you know, you got the one word answers, hey, and it's like, oh, no, this is what Terry is. <laughs> yeah. Um, they're the ones where... They couldn't. They don't. They don't know your name. They don't want to be interviewed by you. And they can't wait to get home. It's like, okay, I get it. Uh, we'll make this as quick and as painless as possible. You know, when they don't look at you in the eye, they're staring at their shoes. It's like you don't know me. You don't want to know me. You don't want to be here. Australia's cringing. I'll get out of here. Yeah, there. Um, I've done those before on radio. Those one-word answer ones, and they're just painful. You end up lasting five minutes and just giving up in the end because it's just not working. Well, I remember Michael Parkinson was interviewing Meg Ryan on Parkinson. No, he's cut the interview short. He, he effectively said, you don't want to be here. He said, no. And he goes, let's just end it. And they disappeared. It was like, okay, perfect. And it was a better interview for doing it. It was just agony to watch. Yeah, it's, it's disappointing when you get those situations, isn't it? But like you said before, yeah. there's, uh, not everyone's the same as um, Kobe Bryant, I suppose. <laughs> no, exactly. Exactly. He was one in a, one, one in a million. Oh, that's a wonderful story. Um, obviously, you know, his passing was just was terrible and, and hearing that would have affected you, no doubt, as well. Um, yeah. before, before I let you go, Ham, just wanted to finish with um, three famous people that you'd love to have dinner with. Who would they be? Bruce, Kobe. I'm going to do three. Can I do three male, three female? Of course you can, yeah. Okay, so Bruce, Kobe, Ali and Feder as four this is this is very hard. those four I just for all the reasons I've mentioned with Fed Kobe and Bruce Ali just because I, I think he's one of the more wonderful leaders of our time Michael Holdings very unlucky not to make the table but um, we'll get to him at you know the second sitting or might have him over for drinks before dinner <laughs> in terms of females um, maybe. Oprah, just to give a perspective of, you know, that sort of always trying to break through a glass ceiling, you know, to become one of the most famous faces in the world as a female and being coloured, I just love, you know, I just love the fact that she's dominated. And when you hear Michael Holding talking about white privilege, it's so real. You know, it's so the fact that she's done so brilliantly. My grandmother, I'd love to have back for one more dinner. She was my social barometer. If I was ever thinking of doing anything that was, 50 50 i think what would gran think so gran would be there um other teresa would give you a pretty good insight into life too i reckon i reckon she'd be <laughs> one yeah i think you've chosen some good ones there Haim. 
Well, what an absolute pleasure it has been today to have you on Legends with Devo, mate. Thanks for taking the time to have a chat and sharing your amazing insights over your career and um, everything else, all your, your amazing knowledge of sport. And uh, keep up the great work on Channel 7. And let's hope uh, the rest of the season can go well and we can have a grand final that we look, for, look forward to, wherever that might be. Absolutely. Yeah, Bebo, thanks for having me on. And yeah, if we can get a grand final of any description, it'd be great. And hopefully those that are listening and watching this stay safe. Thanks for having me on. No, thanks so much, mate. Take care.